I hear it all the time. If you fast too much, you're going to mess up your female hormones and it's going to completely just destroy everything that you know. So ladies, you get freaked out about it. I understand because there's so much noise out there. Let's clear it all up. This is going to be unbiased. Okay. Yes, there's good and bad with fasting, intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting and everything. When it comes down to fertility, when it comes down to your cycle, when it comes down to anything female hormone related. So let's go ahead and let's dive in. Let's have a little bit of fun with this. Now let's start off with PCOS. Now I'm not gonna make this whole video about PCOS, don't worry, but it's worth mentioning because it allows me to like paint a big picture that has to do with like the entire like reproductive system as far as fasting is concerned. Okay, when we fast, insulin levels drop. Kind of a no brainer, we're not eating. So of course insulin levels are going to drop. But what's interesting is that insulin resistance plays such a powerful role with PCOS. Researchers said, like, we gotta start figuring this out. Like, if we can control insulin levels, maybe we can control PCOS a little bit more. So to paint a picture, here's what it looks like in terms of when the brain sends a signal to the reproductive organs. And then I'll tie in how fasting plays in with that. I'll make it quick. So the hypothalamus sends a signal to the pituitary gland. Then the pituitary gland sends a signal to the follicle stimulating hormone to produce follicle stimulating hormone. This follicle stimulating hormone then tells the eggs to start growing. As the eggs start to grow and form, then estrogen is released. Okay, estrogen is a good thing in this case and estrogen goes back to the hypothalamus and sends another signal which triggers luteinizing hormone to be produced. And this luteinizing hormone triggers ovulation. Okay, now a very important part in this, as I mentioned, is estrogen. Insulin inhibits estrogen. So when we have chronically high levels of insulin, we inhibit estrogen, and therefore we make it so ovulation doesn't really occur as well. So eggs can sort of get trapped or never really fully formed, and that causes all kinds of backing up and issues and ultimately painful cysts to form, but also can trigger a bunch of like irregularity. So insulin's a very big issue with that. But it's not the only issue. But anyhow, if you start looking at the data, you find that, wow, like 70% of people that have PCOS also are insulin resistant. Kind of start connecting the dots there. Well, brand spanking new research. And at time of filming, this came out like a week ago. It was published in the Journal of Translational Medicine. And good news, because it found that five weeks of 16-8 intermittent fasting improved symptoms of PCOS significantly. It also improved the levels of free testosterone, it improved the levels of sex hormone binding globulin, which is critical with this whole process, and it showed that 73% of the women that intermittent fasted showed significant improvements in cycle irregularity. Whoa, what's going on here? I think it has something to do with the lower levels of insulin. We're not having this chronically high levels of insulin, so during at least one period of that five week time, we're probably affecting estrogen in a positive way. Suddenly estrogen signaling is able to be up again and all of a sudden that's able to send a signal to the hypothalamus and luteinizing hormone, everything kind of kickstarts. That's my hypothesis from this pretty solid and clear study. What about being on the other end of the spectrum? It doesn't have to do with PCOS. What if you're just very irregular with your cycles? Or what if you're someone that is having fertility issues? Well, should you be concerned with intermittent fasting? Well, first let's take a look at one study that took a look at women that were fasting for 72 hours, but these women were lean, under 20% body fat. So with women, they typically say 22% is like the bottom, like leanness you should be, like you should be above that. I kind of beg to differ sometimes, but the point is under 20%, things start to change a little bit. So they took lean women, they had them fast. Well, they had them fast during their mid follicular phase. So a very important part where luteinizing hormone would be critical. So during this period, they would fast and they found that their luteinizing hormone pulses decreased by 19%. They had 19% less luteinizing hormone pulses, all the way to the point where follicular growth actually slowed down and was ultimately even like stopped. This could be a very big problem. So you can see like, a lean person that is fasting, that could cause an issue where they are not able to produce an egg. But what's wild is they took this same study and they did it with women that were not super lean, not overweight, but just not super lean. They still had a 15 to 20% reduction in luteinizing hormone pulses, but no issue with the follicular growth, no issue there at all. So it seems to be that being lean 
triggered so much stress on the body when fasting, the body went into a heavier shock. It said, wait a minute, whoa, this, is, this person's too lean to be fasting. So it triggered, then it triggered some reproductive issue. So what do you do? Well, the main thing is, as a lady, you probably just wanna be concerned with fasting for over, say, 36 hours, okay? Because there's plenty of studies that take a look at women during Ramadan, and they found that even after 30 days of ultimately intermittent fasting in a pretty extreme way with Ramadan, they didn't have any real issue with the reproductive system or hormones as long as their caloric intake was normal. So if you're lean, you probably want to make sure that you're intermittent fasting in like an every other day fashion or just a few times per week kind of fashion because you can still absolutely get the longevity benefit, the cognitive benefit, the digestive benefit. I'm not saying don't fast, but for body composition, putting yourself in a deficit with fasting, if you're already lean, you probably don't wanna do that. You probably wanna start adopting some other principles. But if you're overweight, you actually have quite a bit of flexibility because you're not going to be running into the reproductive issue. Your body still has plenty of you know, stuff to deal with first, right? It can have some fat to burn. Anyhow, moving on to the next component of this study, the thyroid. You, ladies all the time concerned the thyroid. And I, I think I have to kind of like knock the rocker for a minute here because we tend to think that the thyroid is like the end all be all, but it's not, okay? The thyroid, yes, it's a regulator of our metabolism, but it's also closely tied into how much we're eating. If you fast, your thyroid levels are going to drop. That doesn't mean they drop forever. You start eating again, your thyroid levels come back. They're very resilient. It's a very resilient gland, okay? So it will come back. In fact, there's studies that demonstrate that like people that have portions of the thyroid removed, like the thyroid can even come back. Like it, it's a powerful gland. So when you fast, yes, your thyroid levels will drop, whether you're male, female, an orangutan, or a dolphin, doesn't matter, okay? But at that point, it comes back. So I just, I wanna just put that one to bed because it doesn't really matter. What matters more is about the thyroid being used for the amount you need at that specific time. So if you're not eating, why would your body rev up the metabolism if you're not eating? It doesn't make sense, right? Let's burn a bunch of fuel that isn't coming in. It's like paradoxical. You can also kind of keep your metabolism stimulated a little bit here and there by having like coffee or having green tea and things like that because it still kickstarts a little bit of those metabolic processes, but it can also trigger more of the autophagy, which can actually be very beneficial for you in a lot of other ways. So, I mean, outside of the thyroid per se, it can still keep you metabolically active. You know, generally what I would do is like I start my morning with coffee and then I transition over to green tea. I put a link down below for the matcha green tea that I typically use. It's called Ujido Matcha. It's a 180 year old matcha green tea company. I talk about them on my channel all the time. They've been a sponsor on this channel for years and years and just I highly recommend them because they're my go-to fasting matcha. So there's a link down below. So men and women alike, it's just, it's nice to be able to switch over to matcha green tea and they have like little convenient stick packs and everything like that. Just super easy, super convenient. So thank you Ujido Matcha for continuing to support all my intermittent fasting crowd on my channel. So use that link down below after this video. Now let's transition into cortisol for a sec. Cortisol is the stress hormone, but it's also good in some ways. Now what's funny is that same study, that 72 hour fast study that looked at the lean women, remember that one? Okay, well they also looked at cortisol levels and they found that lean women had higher spikes in cortisol during a fast compared to not as lean women. That kind of makes sense though, right? Again, already lean, not a lot of body fat on you, so a fast is a much bigger threat. It's a much bigger risk, right? Lean person versus not lean person, both in the same not eating scenario, the lean person is going to be in a much more precarious situation because if they go without eating, they could die. If the overweight person goes without eating, they have some to burn, okay? So cortisol levels spike naturally. Well, okay, what's the problem with that? Because cortisol can actually be fat burning in some ways, but studies have demonstrated that if cortisol levels are elevated for too long, it starts to turn some of our fat into visceral fat. That's not good. That's why cortisol is associated with belly fat, but it's not just associated with belly fat, it's associated with visceral fat, which is the fat that surrounds our organs that is metabolically active in a bad way with macrophages and high amounts of basically immunologically active components. Bad news. So. What do we do there? Well, if you're lean, you want to pay attention to not fasting consistently. You want to be, again, fasting two, three times per week to just kind of maintain and making sure that your calories are in line where they need to be to maintain. Otherwise, your cortisol levels are going to elevate. Even though you might potentially look a little leaner, you could be making that fat into visceral fat, which is not as good. If you're overweight or you have a little bit more fat on you, you're probably fine to fast a little bit more aggressively. But again, 
Should we keep it under 36 hours? Probably. I mean, the occasional long-term fast, like once a quarter, probably realistic. But with cortisol, we don't want to mess around. We don't want that visceral fat. Okay, that leads me into the next one, which is so important. It's leptin, and it's very misunderstood, the poor misunderstood leptin. We think of leptin as this cheat meal hormone that we always want elevated because leptin is a signaling device from the fat that tells the brain to rev up the metabolism, so we think more leptin equals more metabolism. That is the case for some. But most of the time, we have so much leptin bombarding the brain that the brain becomes leptin resistant. And leptin can't really do its job anymore. So it's sending this fuzzy signal to the brain. The brain's not answering the phone. Well, there's a study that was published in the Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism that found that during a fast, women's leptin levels can drop by 61%. So again, at first glance, like most people on the internet would say, don't fast, your leptin levels are going to crash and your metabolism will slow down. Okay, two problems with that. First of all, your leptin levels go right back once you eat again. They just drop while you're fasting. Okay, second of all, a little break in leptin is probably exactly what you need to give that leptin resistance a chance to recover. The brain is constantly receiving this leptin signal and then finally the leptin signal goes away for a little bit so the brain has a chance to chill and might actually pick up the phone again. Okay, so leptin, we gotta give it a break so that leptin resistance can kinda go away. But in the case of female reproductive, well, okay, leptin is critical because leptin is also telling the brain, hey, this person's healthy, they got plenty of fat on hand, they're ready to bear a child, they're ready to go through the whole system and create an egg and everything. You gotta think of how the body's working here, okay? Biology, it's simple. So if our leptin levels are low during a fast, then yeah, that signal is dropping. And that is gonna tell the brain that you are not fit to bear a child at that point in time. But when you eat again and your leptin levels come back up, then guess what? you're right back to normal. But if you can improve that signaling by occasionally giving your leptin levels a break and that brain a break, then maybe it can improve that signaling and perhaps, possibly, hypothetically, improve fertility. So does fasting mess up your hormones? Yeah, but so does going for a walk. So does going for a run. It all messes up your hormones. It's your job to mess up your hormones so that your body knows how to course correct. It's called homeostasis. It's not bad to mess up your hormones. It's only bad if it becomes chronic. It only becomes bad if it's this exogenous like, usage of compounds that are messing up your hormones. Allow your body to be resilient, but also be responsible. Stress and that hormetic curve to a certain degree. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to check out Ujido Matcha down below, and I'll see you tomorrow.